enjoy Tornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I've got some in-house guests across the table today, directly in front of me, familiar voice, Judd Jerzinka, and then beside him, our military and law enforcement product manager, new face, new voice to the podcast, Scott Javits. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good to be here. So... Before we get into today's topic, which I'm pretty excited about, I've not really seen it addressed elsewhere in, uh, in, in podcast format, um, to kind of lay some groundwork, we should probably talk about Scott a little bit, because Scott, you've been with the company now for probably close to a decade. Yes. And, and in that military and law enforcement role, but you've got some, some background that kind of gives you some credibility, if you will, in those fields. So... Uh, let's talk a little bit about that so that our listeners can get an idea of where you're coming from and then uh, talk us through your precision tactics and training uh, because I know that's a big part of, of what you've done in the past and what you do today and then what you do professionally uh, here at Hornady. That'd be great. So background is just that, military and law enforcement. Started off with uh, Navy, got out of that and rolled into Nebraska State Patrol following Two years of working the road there, I ended up getting onto the FBI's task force, uh, working in narcotics primarily. And seven years into that, I got five years with DEA following that, doing the exact same thing, and decided to take an early retirement and come over here. So, wow, it, that sounds like a lot of life crammed into just a few years. It was a busy time. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a busy time. And some folks that I know that have done similar things, the, yeah, the, it's an accelerated timeline when you're working with those agencies, doing what you guys are doing and, uh, you know, being even in here in Nebraska in a, such a low population density, there's still a lot of action going on that probably not most people know about, or you know, it's going on behind the scenes. There's a lot going on. There's always a lot going on. And that's the good thing about it is it keeps, it keeps it behind the scenes. So it's not, uh, creating problems in the public in the forefront. So the that's more proactive awesome. things are the less reactive they have to be. Okay. So that's, you know, pre Hornady. And then you, you came on not long after I joined the team, uh, to focus on the military and law enforcement aspect of what Hornady does, which is since you've been on board, that volume of, of contracts and, you know, our, our law enforcement presence with our critical duty ammunition has just been phenomenal. So what does your professional career look like here at Hornady specifically? Specifically, I work more with the end users. So that's my goal is educating on that side of it. A lot of people don't understand what really happens terminally. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of education on the terminal performance side that a lot of other people don't have. So we start talking about that aspect of it. How do you do the training? And not just terminal performance training, but some of the shooting stuff that applies to it as well. I mean, it all ties into PRS and NRL in some ways because the sniper side of it is a, is a huge you know, side of our business. So mm -hmm. teaching those guys and educating them on what we can do for them on how to enhance that performance is a big deal. Awesome. Well, and that, that lends itself perfectly to our topic today when you're talking about training and education. And on a personal note, you still are involved with that training and education. Talk us through that. Yeah. So I own my own uh, training company on the side. It's an S Corp. And on that, I've been a professional firearms instructor on the tactical side for almost 20 years now. So on that, it deals specifically with handgun, pistol, shotgun, carbine, the whole gambit. So we focus a little bit on everything, but we really focus on the tactics side of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now in the tactical world, in the law enforcement, and the military side of things, you've obviously got those bases covered. And where me and Judd come in, we're just running around the woods, you know, hunting and stuff, right? So what's your background in that? I know you grew up rural Nebraska in, you know, kind of the heartland of the heartland state here. Uh, tell us about that and your hunting experiences growing up. Yeah, growing up, we had access to a ranch and a farm. So we were hunting all the time. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for us to run the creek bed and, you know, go out and do our thing. So everything from hunting pheasants, raccoons, you know, all the way up to deer, it was a free for all. It was just, you know, whatever season it was, that's what you were doing. So hunting and fishing was a way of life growing up. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that really rounds things out. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because my mind was thinking the same thing, you know, like from my perspective and Seth, you're maybe a little bit similar to mine. You know, I grew up hunting quite a bit, you know, I did some plinking shooting here and there, but you know, 
my rifles prior to working the Hornady do not and did not have many shots on them. <laughs> so, you know, since I've, I've kind of got into doing more shooting and shooting steel, different things, haven't really dove into the PRS stuff yet, but there's some pressure from behind the scenes here, Preston. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, sometimes we get to do some, some pretty awesome things here at Hornady. And from my perspective on the hunting side, it's like, Every now and then you got to kind of stop and, and just be grateful. And man, can you believe where we're at right now? You know, growing up oh. hunting and shooting. So me on the hunting side, I have that connection. And, and Seth, you have the hunting and shooting side. Scott, you do as well. But then to have your law enforcement background and then transitioning that to what you do now in regards to law enforcement and military. I mean, man, you're, you're full circle. So it's got to be pretty neat to see some of the things that you're doing nowadays here at Hornady. No, I love my job. It's great. It's working with the end users, getting everything rolling and moving is a, it's a wonderful deal. And you never know where next week's going to lead. So that's awesome. Well, and we've got, you know, the, in my opinion and, and, you know, the opinion of many others, we really do have the best ammunition. And as a company, I feel like we have some of the best knowledge and understanding on internal and external ballistics, but also terminal performance, that terminal ballistics aspect that not everybody really understands. And we've just done a, a podcast episode with Mr. Jay Quinlan himself. And uh, I feel like that's a field that there's a lot of misunderstandings in. And so, like I said earlier, and like Judd just commented on, you having obviously the, the end user experience of being a kid growing up around firearms, using them safely, hunting, shooting, and then getting into the tactical aspect of it. You've got uh, a great level of expertise in that, and now you're in the education and training part of it. Uh, and again, just really solidifies, one, you know, we're lucky to have you as a company, but two, in relation to this podcast, you're the right guy to talk to. And we were talking about doing this podcast. It was like, all right, we got to get Scott on here. So without further ado, you know, the, the topic of this podcast, I want to just kind of dive into my experience, Judd's experience, your experience and expertise on when you're when you have a firearm when is it appropriate and what are some of the implications and what are some of the nuance to having a round in the chamber whether that be i'm getting ready to go to the grocery store or i'm grabbing my rifle and i'm hiking into the hills to go hunting at what point uh do you put that round in the chamber and again what are some of the implications of that so we can kind of split this up into you know your personal defense situation or your concealed carry that kind of thing uh, on body carry, off body carry, and then we can put another division there and then talk about the hunting aspect because I know there's a lot of different opinions on when it's appropriate to have a round in the chamber. So I think that's probably a good spot too to, to put out a disclaimer here potentially of, yeah. you know, hey, these are things that we do, you do, I do, Scott does, or these are things to just consider, you know, when you're making that choice or, you know, however you're going to carry hunting or concealed carry or whatnot. So there's a lot of ways to do things. So, yeah. you know, we'll just kind of cover some of the things to consider or why we do things we do. That's a great point, Judd. We're not telling you, the listener, what to do. We're just discussing what we do and what Scott's seen in his training, uh, both on the civilian side and in the law enforcement side. So I think maybe we'll start with kind of that concealed carry or that, you're, you know, you're carrying a firearm for defensive purposes. Um, you know, what are some things to consider going into that and then we can get into when do you have one in the pipe you know one thing i know you teach in your uh your defensive pistol 101 kind of class is selecting the right factory loaded ammunition probably that's a, that might be a better place to start no that's exactly it so you have to look at the ammo and you have to look at the platform because People don't understand that as you reduce barrel length, you reduce velocity. Well, if you reduce velocity, carrying certain types of rounds, it actually increases your penetration depth, decreases your wound channel size. So you can have opposite ends of the spectrum occurring there. So even if you do everything right, liability-wise, you can be wrong. So people really have to look at that terminal aspect to figure out what's going there. The main element that I would really focus on on the concealed carry side is experience. Where do you live in that experience realm as to whether or not you have one in a pipe or not? Because mm. can you, you know, you have to follow the four cardinal rules all the time because that's the safety side of it. So if you're violating those, no matter if you have one or not, at some point, something negligent is going to happen and that shouldn't occur. So always follow those four safety 
rules because that just makes life easy. 100%. Look at this. 100 free bullets when I buy these select Hornady reloading tools. Wow, 500 free bullets with certain Hornady reloading presses and kits. Well, what do they have? Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading bench. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, come by and... So the four weapon safety rules, and there's a fifth in there as well, but the, the cardinal four, as we learned them, was treat, never, keep, keep. So treat every weapon as if it were loaded. Never point your weapon at anything you don't want to destroy. Keep your finger straight and off the trigger until you're ready to fire, and keep the weapon on safe until you intend to fire. And then that fifth rule is know your target and what lies beyond it. Correct. And that's, that's really the key aspects that you've got to look at there is you've got to follow those before you do anything else. Sure. So as soon as you get into that, then you have to start looking at the next aspect of it. So if you're concealed carry, you're going to the store, it doesn't matter if grocery store, hardware store, whatever, just being in your own vehicle. Yeah, day to day. Day to day, you have to look at what type of experience do I have? How comfortable am I with the gun? And how well do I know how to use it? Because if you're worried about having one in the chamber, we should probably stop carrying at that point and get more education. So therefore you do get to that comfort level where you are confident in your abilities because that confidence is what you really need so that you know where your limitations are. Sure. If you have limitations, it's time to get more education. And everybody should constantly be educated. I myself go to classes just to get spun up on different techniques, things of that nature that might be new and upcoming. So that's a good point. If, if you're consciously really debating whether or not you should have one in the pipe, that's probably an indicator to pursue more training and structured training, not just going to the range. I mean, there's something to be said about going to the range, handling the firearm, getting really comfortable with that way, but also pursuing that next echelon of formal instruction. Correct. That's, that's truly where you have to be. So once you get comfortable with it, then you have to look at the other three dynamics, and that's what I call it is time, distance, and cover. Because when I look at that, I want to reduce my time. I have to have time to react to a threat. So how do I keep that? The easiest way to keep that is to create distance between you and the threat, wherever that is. And at the same time, utilize some type of cover to balance those scales out. So in doing so, if I've got that round in the chamber, I'm reducing that time to react and it's giving me that comfort level where I can deal with this threat as I need to. But if you're once again uncomfortable with any of those aspects or not understanding how those actually play out, you've got to stop and it goes back to that training routine again. Get to the point where you are comfortable and safe. Safe is a key element going back to full circle again, mm -hmm. but you've got to understand the tactic side of it, but you also have to understand the full safety side of it as well. Yeah, that's yeah, a, a yeah, key set of points, and it, it does always come back to safety, but if you are in an environment where, to throw more dynamics into it, you know, maybe your, your situation could dictate, you know, if you're talking about how far away is the threat, well, here in rural Nebraska, the, the you know, the, the chances of, you know, the, the rates of violent crime as a whole are incredibly low compared to a lot of other places. Uh, and just everything is more spread out. People are further apart. You know, there's less people at the grocery store than in a lot of those urban places. Does that go into your decision making on whether or not you would carry one uh, chambered or not? Not necessarily, no, because most of those interactions are going to occur where? They're going to occur at the distance we're at now or closer because people are going to want to get close to you with some type of weapon. It may not be a firearm. It may be a knife. It may be a baseball bat. It, yeah, who whatever. knows? could just be open fist, but it's one of those open hand, open fist. It's one of those that they're going to be very close proximity to you. So you are not going to have a lot of time to react in that. Most people's reaction time will be 10 yards or more. So by the time they actually see a threat, identify what the threat is and can react to that threat, that person has covered 10 yards, approximately 30 feet to get to them. So you better know right now. Exactly. So by the time you get the gun out, you're going to have to go to work if that's the case, if you're going to try saving your life or those of someone else. So wow. that's crazy that that distance can be covered in the time it takes you to recognize. And that's probably, you know, you get the, the shock of, oh my, you know, is this really, is this real life? Is this happening? Cause you live 99.9% .9 of your life and nothing like that ever happens. Probably hard to change. Gears. So I, I took uh, your concealed carry course, shoot, it's been a handful of years now, but I do, I'll probably butcher this, but, uh, talk about 
the the drill that you did. I can't remember if we drew as you ran from a direction to like just to see how quick those things happen. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so that's reaction or gap drill, and that's where that ten yards comes from. Is people talk about a twenty one foot rule all the time. Is twenty one feet's where you want to be for your for your window. That's twenty one feet when you're anticipating it. So what I do with students is I'll put them on the line. Everybody's got a completely empty gun. Targets are down range. And I'll say go, and when I say go, I start moving. And they begin the draw and pointing down at their targets. They then see how far I ran by the time they're able to get one, you know, one trigger pull off on an empty gun after a safety check. And what happens is I will cover usually a minimum of 30 feet before that class has got everything locked and loaded and rolling. So it's, uh, it's an eye-opener for everybody. And for some of those people, it's 45 to 50 feet. Wow. And that's where it comes down to, I ask everybody, how do you get faster? You have to practice and you have to practice the correct way because if you start cutting corners, you're going to lose something else somewhere else. So Mm -hmm. you've got to have a good balance point across the board. Yeah, it was, it was a huge eye opener when when he did that drill. It was, it was wild. Uh, How, how, you know, it doesn't take you very long to draw, right? but it doesn't take you very long to cover cover some ground either. So and I'm not nearly as fast as I used to be. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it it was wild. It It was an eye opener. That's for sure. Well, and going back to the training aspect. In that drill specifically, you know, just drawing from your carry position. It's one thing to have an outside the waistband holster at three o'clock and, you know, you're drawn like John Wayne or whatever. But if you're on the appendix or at like 430 and it's tucked, uh, the time it would take you to retrieve your weapon from your concealed position, you know, that's uh, needs to be practiced, needs to be trained. You got to have experience just with that aspect. And that's a that's a big uh, component right there because you see a lot of people that will go to ranges and they're only allowed to practice with an outside the waistband or from a three o'clock, nine o'clock draw where they're, you know, left-handed, right-handed. Mm-hmm. So they have to keep everything straight or they're only allowed to shoot off the table. So in doing so, they don't get that practice time. So if they're used to always drawing from a three o'clock and yet they're doing a cross carry or behind the back, inside the pants, something like that, they're seconds, milliseconds wasted because they're now trying, they're reaching for that gun, but it's not at their hip now. It's mm-hmm. somewhere else. So they're having to basically do their own pat down to figure out where did I put that to and how do I get it back yeah. out? That muscle memory. Mm-hmm. Got to develop that. And that takes hours, thousands of repetitions to develop that. Correct. So, and if they're always leaving it in one place, that's their problem is they're practicing here, but then they're carrying somewhere else. Mm-hmm. That's, you're doing the exact opposite of what you want to try and achieve. Are there things to consider, you know, if you're carrying on your person or carrying in a bag or, you know, is there, does that change the, the decision as far as to carry oh, yeah. one in the pipe or not? Is there, is there There's things a lot to of, consider? Yeah, the concealed carry backpacks and the, in the 511 briefcases and all these, you know, different off body carries yeah. that, you know, they've got concealed little pockets on them. That's a good point, Judd. What does that change for your opinion, Scott? In my opinion, it goes back to, once again, what's my comfort level? What's my safety level? Because it has to balance out. So if I'm doing an appendix carry, where's that muzzle pointed at? It's pointed into some other regions that, you know, bleed very easily. So you've got to really cover that and make sure that you're not doing something in a moment of stress that's going to create problems there. Same thing in a backpack or a purse. If you have a purse and you're carrying a firearm in there, it should be a designated gun purse that has a built-in holster rather than just shoved in there rolling around because if you reach in to get it if you don't have anything over that trigger guard you could set it off right there which way is it pointing Mm -hmm. now you're injuring somebody else that's on once again we go back to liability now because where's that round going to go off who's it going to hit yep well and and if it's off body are you always in positive control of that purse bag whatever that's exactly it. And that's what you have to look at is backpacks. Once again, if you're carrying a backpack, get a system that has a holster in it. So number one, it covers a trigger guard so it can't negligence the discharge. At the same time, make sure it's pointing in a safe direction when you're running it. So yeah. same thing with the purses. A lot of those purses, you can go muzzle down inside the purse. So where's it at again? If it discharges, it's going to go into the ground rather than horizontal. horizontal into somebody. Yeah. It sounds like if you were considering that off-body carry in one of those bags that has you know the right holster for it, if your threat assessment in your area, you know, your day-to-day, pick on Judd, for example, and I'm, I'm in this exact same boat because we live in the same direction, but Judd travels 50 miles to yeah, work. about right at it. Yeah. yeah. So Judd travels 50 miles to work, passes four houses, right? Like, yeah. you know, just <laughs> close. Yeah, yeah. Very, very <laughs> rural. And so, you know, he, his concealed carry is probably going to end up shooting, you know, 
deer that got hit by a car or a raccoon or a skunk that's in his yard or, you know, whatever. It's kind of like that. So would you let that off body carry probably go? It's more okay, if that's the right term, to not have one in the chamber in that situation. Again, if you're off body carry, you always have positive control of that bag. Um, would that, how would that weigh into your decision making? That I don't, don't think really weighs into my decision making. I think it's more the comfort level and the safety level. So as long sure. as you're meeting all your safety levels and you've got the comfort level, whether it's off body or not, as long as it's a secure off body, I don't see a problem with carrying in the chamber, provided that you're meeting all of your other mm. thresholds. So if you're comfortable with it and it's safe, go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. If it's questionable or you're not comfortable, don't do it. Yeah. So that's came up now a handful of times. I mean, that, that's that been, been your answer, which, which is a great answer. And I'm sure you've had all different walks of life of people approach you about, you know, taking your courses or just concealed carry in, in general, you know, as far as experience level goes, you know, you've had Uber users, hunters, you know, shooters, and I'm sure you've, you've had people that didn't have very much firearm experience. So if somebody comes to you, you know, inquiring about concealed carry, you know, what is your statement? You know, how do you walk somebody through the process of, you know, if they're deciding, you know, maybe I should get a concealed carry. I don't have one. Should I get one? If someone comes to you asking that question, you know, how do you kind of help them meander the, the topic there? No, that's a great question. So we like to start out with actually sizing the person for the firearm just to make sure that they get that comfort level because most people will buy a firearm based on, well, this is what you carry. This is what you carry. This is what Preston carries. Everybody's got their own flavor and it may not be the same make, may not be the same model. So what we really focus on is how does a gun fit in the hand? Can I actually control the safety with one hand? Because if it's a gun that I run and I've got to use my off hand to run the safety, that's not doing me a lot of good in a gunfight. Because if I draw it out and this guy breaks my arm while I've got my defense up, how am I going to get that safety off? That's not doing me any good whether I have one in the pipe or don't have one in the pipe. So sure. finding that true balance point of how the firearm fits you is a big key element. Once you have that, then you have to look at how does that person carry it? And once again, we always recommend carrying it so that you have access to it with both hands. So the standard three o'clock position may not be something you want to do because I can reach it, but you may not be able to based on body size, arm length, things of that nature. So you want to find a balance point as to where we carry. It goes back to off body. Off body is a great system for that based on what you have, but usually off body takes more time to access than what you do when you're on body. So there are key elements there that you look at, and then you have to get them once they have that right holster and they have the right gun, then you start walking them through the right draw to cut down on that time then they get comfortable. Once they get comfortable, they feel they're safe, they're doing everything correctly, you're, it's baby steps. You're, it's yeah. foundation training. So every time they get to a level, you bring them up another level. Now, as you know, we end it on a scenario. Why do we end it on a scenario? To induce more stress because we want to show what's going to happen, how fast all those wheels start spinning and how everything that you just learned over the last four hours falls apart very quickly. Why? You don't have the repetition that you talked about earlier. So at that point, it gives them the moment when they get done with that scenario and it's done in the blind so nobody can see what the next person is doing or you can't cheat by saying, oh, well, they did this, so I'm going to do this. Right. You get done with that, then you get done and you ask everybody that question. How did you feel? What did that do to your response? And everybody is like, some people are confident. Some people are like, oh, I didn't think I would do that. You told me all day I would do this and I would do that and I told you I wouldn't and I just did all of those things that I wasn't supposed to do. Correct. How do you get over that? Training. You have to spend the time. You can't just go through a simple class, walk out the door and be like, I've got this. Let's go. No, yeah. you've got to take that time to balance that out and get that balance of speed, accessibility, and security all in one package. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've had a bunch of people ask me over the years, and I'm sure you have too, Judd, uh, that same question you basically just set up for Scott there was, you know, hey, what do, what do you think? Do, do you carry? What should I, should I carry? And one of the one of the answers I've given people in the past is if, if you're willing to dedicate the time to get, to be comfortable, then yes, you should. If you can, you should. And, uh, you never know when you might need to shoot a skunk in the yard, for example, yeah. or, uh, you know, defend your life for others. And if you can, you should, but you have to be honest with yourself. Are you going to dedicate the effort that is required? Cause it's one thing to have a permit and have a pistol. 
and carry, and it's another thing to actually be a, a, a competent and responsible concealed carry person. No, and that uh, and everything that we're talking about does apply to the hunting side too, and we can kind of shift gears there yeah. if you want to and, and yeah. roll across that Before side. Before we do, I have one one other question. It's not related to whether or not you have one chambered, um, but uh, in your experience being on the law enforcement side as a law enforcement agent and then also training on the on the civilian side how much weight do you carry or do you put in uh choosing the factory ammo and the, what i mean by that specifically is uh i've had people when i used to work in tech that would call up and they were very specific that they wanted to buy ammunition factory produced that was stated clearly on the box it was for personal defense so that in a lawsuit happy country they didn't look like they had the wrong bullet or had something for you know for hunting that wasn't for defense or whatever um is there any weight to that lawsuits are lawsuits and you never know what's coming down the pipeline until they get there um but i agree with you completely it's one of those that laying out that groundwork ahead of time because it's all pre-planning everything is pre-planning from the time you wake up in the morning until you go to bed and you're formulating what you're doing the next day it's all pre-planning carrying what ammunition you carry should be no different so you have to look at those aspects based on you know, there are certain states that you can't have hollow point ammunition. So that's where, you know, when you look at that, critical defense, critical duty don't necessarily fall into that. So you have to look at, let's just take those two. If I look at critical defense or critical duty, they both run great. It's what do I need? Do I need just open air engagements or do I need to worry about barriers like law enforcement does? And if that's a concern of mine, that starts to narrow down the field very quickly on which one I need to carry. What I like about it is if I'm, if you look personal or critical defense in a personal setting, I'm using that for defensive position. I'm using that as a defensive round. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it kind of spells itself out. You look at some of the other stuff that's out there and some of the other ammos that have some exotic names and, you know, kind of play on the, the death factor of, you know, RIP or DRT or any of that. That can start to lead you down a path that you may not want to go down if you have to go to court and somebody asks, well, what were you carrying? Mm-hmm. And you list off some of this ammo that, you know, you're like, it's not going to sound very good. It's not going to sound good. It's going to lay some groundwork that you may not want to have laid out there. Yep. While we're on that, should we hit on the difference between critical defense, critical duty? Yeah, and no better person to describe that difference than the guy, you know, uh, Scott. Yeah, lay us out the difference for critical defense, critical duty, what they're good for, and what maybe they wouldn't be the best option for. Okay, so critical defense is designed for defensive situations. So it's designed for your small, compact, subcompact firearms, very short barrel lengths, and the penetration depth is hovering somewhere between 9 to 12 inches. So the the slightly under what the FBI protocol is, but it's mainly designed so that it doesn't over-penetrate. You don't have to worry about those liability concerns on over-penetration. You know, shootings are different. What you hit, what you don't hit, that can create the same liability. So you have to take that into effect. The critical defense is truly there as a defensive round for Backup guns, personal defense, home defense, things of that nature. Okay. Critical duty is designed for that aspect of you want a barrier blind round designed to meet FBI protocol, for example, where you're trying to balance out and have 12 to 18 inches of penetration regardless of what that barrier is. So if somebody's behind cover and they're trying to harm you or loved ones, you have that ability to punch through that barrier and still get the same penetration depths you would in open air. So it's going to give you closer to 15 inches of penetration. Okay. So... Yeah, that really, that really brief explanation, though, that is very clearly spelled out. If you have a, a firearm that you're using for defense, critical defense is the best choice because that critical duty ammunition, like you mentioned, that's those enhanced penetration characteristics, it was designed to meet the FBI protocol. So to shoot through a car door, through a car window, through wall board, through plywood, and then get to its target and go those 12 to 16 inches of penetration. So if that isn't something you're specifically after, opt for that critical defense ammo. Correct. And critical defense is still going to run in a full-size gun as well. It's what type of, it's just not going to penetrate as deep because the more velocity we have, the more expansion we have, the less penetration depth we get. Is, is there some recoil reduction there? Uh, a little bit. There's recoil reduction. Both of them, because of the powders that we use, it's really difficult to tell that compared to some of the other rounds that are out there on the market. So, yeah. And we use that, that low flash support. Uh, propellant so you don't get that big muzzle flash from those shorter barrels which is nice yeah yep. so nighttime settings you you're not blinding yourself when when you're shooting so yeah. 
Well, in summary, before we shift gears, like you mentioned, into that hunting side of things, from the personal defense uh, weapon on your person, it sounds like carrying with one in the chamber is desirable in all cases as long as your training and your comfortability and your safety are all handled. Correct. Yeah. As long as you're covering that whole wheelhouse, there's, there's no reason you shouldn't be. If you are hesitant at all, like you said, I should stop, reassess, what do I need to do to get myself to that comfort level and yep. take that, whether it's more training, whether it's more range time, get yourself out there, enjoy the time on the range. Yeah, absolutely. Good way to put it. Well, again, I mean, a lot of the holsters, the majority, I assume, you know, cover the trigger. I mean, there's not, it's not like you're, it's, it's not like you're just willy nilly, you know. I, I mean, was about to say willy nilly. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what else to, how to describe it, but it's like, there's a lot of steps already made to, to. If, if trigger pull is the concern, you know, a lot of the, the concealed carry firearms have heavier triggers. You yeah. Know, no they, mechanical safety usually. Yep, yep. Yep. They'll have an internal safety or trigger safety somewhere. Drop safeties are built in. One of the things that goes back to the holster though, speaking of which is what do you wear when you're carrying concealed? Because certain jackets, certain vests, things of that have the, uh, sides on them with the elastic cords, the bungees. And what'll happen is those have those little drawstrings, those little plastic ones. If you're not careful and you're holstering your gun, those little balls can drop inside of there. And as you holster down, it basically takes that trigger safety off and you can have negligent discharge. So once again, where's that gun pointed when you're holstering it? Because that can create its own problems. So, yeah. All right. So guys, listen to this podcast, do what's right for you. Um, do what you're comfortable with, but you should be actively pursuing the level of training and familiarity with your firearm and your concealed location that you're carrying with one in the chamber, if possible. Exactly. Great time to take a pause and hear from our sponsors, Hornady. <laughs> the Hornady CX Copper Alloy Expanding Bullet. CX bullets feature the advanced heat shield tip that resists aerodynamic heating and provides a consistently high BC. Hard hitting and deep penetrating, CX bullets are constructed of rugged monolithic copper alloy that retains 95% or more of their original weight for devastating terminal performance. Available in factory loaded ammunition as well as component bullets for reloaders. CX bullets from Hornady. Now shifting gears from the concealed carry, the personal defense type stuff, now we're getting into the hunting world which has uh, a different set of concerns I guess, but, but largely the same. And I want to hear your guys' opinion because I know what I do. I know what I grew up doing. Um, I'm curious to see what you guys do because everybody's a little bit different. So I'll turn it right over across the table here. When it comes to hunting, whether that be taking a shotgun on a turkey hunt or taking a, a, a rifle to the top of a mountain to hunt bighorn sheep, what are you guys doing uh, as far as carrying one in the chamber while in the field? Judd, do you want to start? And I'll. Uh... Yeah, I mean... I... It's, it is somewhat broad and it, and it kind of, it depends on what I'm doing, what I'm hunting. Uh, yeah, obviously upland hunting, things like that, you know, when, when you're out in the field with dogs, you're walking, yeah. you know, obviously you're, you're loaded up, uh, you know, big game deer style of hunting. If I'm walking in, you know, I, a lot of times I, I don't have one in the chamber, so and that's for a lot of different reasons, you know, I probably most times have a foreseen, Hey, I'm getting to this area. And, uh, you know, if I see a C game or see, I'm getting ready to, to make a move or do whatever, then I'll go ahead and, and rack one in. But a lot of it kind of depends. I was thinking about this, uh, as we brought up this topic, you know, I would say coyotes, I'm, I'm different you know coyote the coyote could pop up anytime when i'm walking loaded. when i'm walking into the set if i'm going to try to do a do a, a calling sequence i'm most times i'm yeah. i'm loading one up and i'm i'm headed out and you know maybe it depends too if if i'm alone a lot of times i'll probably have one in the chamber if i'm with somebody that's another consideration you know sure. i most times i won't have one in the chamber but i don't know it kind of just depends but i would say probably more often than not other than when I'm getting ready to make a move to take a shot, I I probably don't hunt with a round in the chamber. And just out of, you know, you want that positive control. You never know when you're hunting, you drop a firearm or, or getting into a stand or getting into a blind or something like that. Yeah. I mean, that 
Yeah, that crosses my mind. The biggest thing, and, and this is just this is just me, just my opinion, and for the style of hunting I do, you know, if uh, if I'm walking in and a deer jumps up and takes off running, I don't know if that's the way I want it to go down. You know, yeah. if it's a if it's a trophy deer, you know, I I, I still don't know if that changes yeah. things. You know, my my game plan. And that's kind of just me as a person, you know, I, I overthink or think, uh, think quite a bit about things, but my mindset is, okay, I bump that deer. He's heading this way. He's probably going here. I'm going to play that strategy game to go find him where he's heading, you right. know, rather than, than taking a, a running shot or whatnot. So to me, you know, hunting with one or walking around other than like, okay, there he is. I'm moving in to, to get this done. I just, I don't. I don't feel like I need yeah. one in the chamber. Here's here's a curveball for you. Muzzle loader. Well, yeah. There we go. So, yeah, again, I think it goes back to uh, you know, I uh, I got married here this last fall and I went out muzzle loader season here in December in Nebraska and Courtney, my wife and I went out. Uh, we pull up, we were hunting cornfields. One of my favorite times times of the year to hunt whitetail oh, yeah. on a cornfield with snow on the ground late December. Uh, and, and I didn't even think about it at the time, but thinking back on how our our most recent hunt went down, which was, yeah, back in December, uh, we pull up, park by the cornfield, get our game plan of where we're headed. And yeah, okay, I had the primer or I had the powder and the projectile down the barrel, mm -hmm. but I walked to the spot we were sitting without a primer in. Right. And a lot of that is too, I mean, it's, it's where we're hunting. We're walking across an open cornfield at you know, two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, majority of the time, there's not going to be a deer out there. So it's right. not like I really felt like I had to be had ready to. for a shot, but, uh, it depends. I haven't done a lot of spot and stock hunting with a muzzle loader, So most of my stuff's been getting to a position, a stand or a tree line or a cornfield and then sitting. And if I'm doing that style of hunting, I, I won't throw one in the tra chamber or put a primer in and tell them to that location. And again, that's just my style. I don't yeah. know. I, that's up a good perspective. Up though. until having this conversation about this podcast, I really haven't thought a whole lot about it. It's just, just what it. I've done. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I don't know. I don't know if it's right or wrong. And I'm interested in hearing this conversation uh, between us guys and then seeing comments after the fact. I'm, I'll just be curious in different things to consider, you know, different perspectives that are out there to see maybe that'll change my perspective. I don't yeah. know. Well, yeah. And that that's a great point to bring up because that is your perspective. And it's obviously something that that you feel comfortable with because you just defaulted to it. Yeah. You didn't even give it a conscious thought. That's just the way you, you did it. And the other point you brought up, that'd be a great opportunity. Drop a comment down here or email us. Let us know what you do. Cause yeah, we, you know, we're not, we're not telling you what to do. We're telling you what we do. Yeah. And, uh, yes, give us your opinion on it. Scott, what do you think on the, in the realm of hunting, what are you doing as far as chambering? chamber and uh, the cartridge? Judd hit on it a little bit. So it kind of depends on what I'm hunting for game. If I'm running bird dogs and stuff like that, yeah, I'm, if I'm out in the field, I'm out in the field. I've got dogs, they're going to be ready to go. That's where I'm running the shotgun that's loaded and ready to run. At the same time, if I'm going into a blind, yeah, if I'm going out hunting ducks early in the morning, I don't have one in the chamber. It's not even shooting time yet. It's yeah. full dark out. So it's, it's full empty until I can start to see what's going on. At the same time, I let terrain kind of dictate what I'm doing. What am I hunting? What's my terrain? So if I've got, we're out in Utah or Wyoming and we've got, you know, the closest shot we're going to get is 300, 400 yards on some of these animals. Yeah. Having one in the pipe is not necessarily my big thing because I've got time to react. I've got distance. I might be spotting and stalking and trying to get in front of them. So I've got time to play. So the terrain plays into it because if it's a lot of ascent or descent or I've got shale, soft sand, something where I'm not going to have stable footing, there's really no reason to have one in the chamber if I have time to get up on top of a hill, set up, and take a longer shot. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you're hunting down south and you're in some of these areas where you've got a 40 to 50 yard window that they're going to pop out and pop in on, on thick trees, things like that, yeah, once I get in there or if I'm slow stalking where I'm taking, you know, I'll call them baby steps where I'm, you know, slowly just moving in, I might have one in the chamber there because your shots are very quick because you just have a window and that, that window is it. You don't have the ability to see a hundred, you know, plus a hundred yards down the range. So same thing, if I'm getting into a blind, getting into a tree stand, there's really no reason to have one in the chamber. You know, there's, there's a little bit that really doesn't play into it. So I really look at what's my terrain, what type of reaction do I have? 
What type of distance do I have to the target? And that kind of starts to dictate whether or not I do. There isn't yeah. a set, this is what I do all the time. It's where am I at? What am I doing? And that's going to determine whether or not I have one in the chamber or not. Yeah, terrain is a good, I just haven't, you guys have way more experience than I do on the spot and stock, you know, Western, if you want to call it, type of hunting. But uh, you know, I haven't really thought about the terrain because, you know, if you pop over a hill, you know, there could be something right there. You know, you may yeah. have to take a quick shot. So that's, that's a good perspective that I don't really have just because I haven't done a, a whole lot of spot and stock style hunting. So that that's a good thing to consider. Yeah, that is a good consideration. And that's what you have to look at is, do, can I take a shot from here? I mean, if you're climbing up a shale face or you're, you're out there, yeah. you know, some of these ascents and descents that we go up and down on, there's no way you're going to take a shot in there at all because it's either too much one way, too much the other way. You're exhausted. You know, you're working climate, you're working elevation. Mm-hmm. You're not going to want to carry one in the chamber because you're not at that peak moment yet. You know, you're, you're still getting to where you want to be. And then once you get there, start evaluating, okay, this is what I can see. Like you said, you get up on top. If I'm coming to the top of Ridge, I'm going to start slowing down because I want to see what's going on, on the other side. I may at that point, if things are looking good or I've got fresh track, I may put one in the chamber before I crest that hill. Yeah. But until then on that walk up, no, there's no real reason to that I see. But that changes based on what are you hunting and what type of train am I working? That's a good, yeah, good set of factors. And as you guys have been talking about why you do what you do, I've been kind of in my head justifying why do I do <laughs> what I do. Uh, and I guess growing up, obviously we talked about pheasants. Both of you guys have yeah, hunting doves, pheasants, you know, prairie chickens, grouse, whatever. Uh, I shoot an over and under shotgun. So there's, yeah, they're in yeah. the pipe. <laughs> uh, so that's, that kind of fixes itself there. But growing up hunting with my 257 Roberts, um, it was very traditional central Nebraska type hunting. We, there wasn't a whole lot of spot and stocking involved. And if, if there was, it wasn't the intent, you know, it just happened that, oh, well, it's, we could see deer way over there. Let's, you know, get over there. Uh, but as a youngster in hunting and grew up around guns, grew up handling guns, grew up shooting guns. Thanks dad. Um, I was pretty comfortable as a young man with, with the firearm. And I guess I just did what dad told me. And when we got to where we were going, or getting close to, Dad would okay, yep, put one in mm-hmm. the chamber, put that thing on safe, yeah, uh, three position safety on the uh, Ruger M77, and uh, that's what we did. So as I got a little bit older and was junior, senior in high school and in college, then you know I was kind of calling my own shots a little bit more, and I found myself empty chamber, bolt closed on an empty chamber, until I was going to shoot something, or if it was like there's this. Tangential, I guess, but there's this one tree that uh, my dad and I would sit at during Nebraska rifle season, and it was in this big draw, this big cottonwood tree up the side of this big finger. And we'd come in on top when we get to the tree, throw it in the chamber, and I shot three deer there in three six uh, three years, and each year they got a little bit bigger, which was pretty cool. <laughs> and is it is a really neat and uh, yeah, a lot of good memories sitting at the base of that tree. But we get to the tree throw one in the chamber, you're good to go. And then as I got a little bit older, I really wouldn't chamber one until I found something I was going to shoot. And then now in the last decade or so of me hunting where I hunt and how I hunt, I carry an empty gun almost exclusively. And I, as you guys were talking, I was kind of playing back. Why, why do I do that? Is it a safety thing? I think so, but it's, and Judd nailed it. And as soon as he said it, I was like, okay, that's, I've had, I've thought this exact same thing where if I get a, an animal that I bump walking through the sand hills and I come up over a sand hill and I, I, I bump a massive deer, my goal in hunting is the experience and to find and beat animals mentally, right? Playing that mental geometry of outsmarting them when their whole goal is to outsmart you. And I, I, I don't want it to go down that way. I don't want to bump a deer and shoot it offhand you know that's not not the goal and it, it would feel almost disingenuine you know because it makes it more about the deer and less about the experience and uh i think that's partially why i carry one on an empty chamber even if if i did shoot it i, I, I don't want it to go down that way yeah well know? just the chess match you know I yeah don't know, I, uh, me the thinking part of it is like okay where did that sucker go i think he's heading here i'm gonna go cut around you know yeah that's what really trips my trigger you know uh, 
getting off topic here, but I compare it to, I've said before on the podcast, and I've say, said it in the office all the time, I am a whitetail guy. That's just, oh, what, yeah. <laughs> that's just what gets me going. So comparing that to the whitetail game is like, I enjoy running the trail cameras. I enjoy doing the food plots, you know, pl- doing the mock scrapes, yeah. just playing Hinge that cuts. whole. cuts, where's yeah, the just, wind, yeah. Just playing that whole chess match, and it's like, I, I don't know if I can say that it's as rewarding as, you know, having a successful hunt, but, it, man, it's right there. It, it may be more. So it's, I compare that to, you know, just the way if I am spot stalking, the handful of times I've been able to do it, you know, it's I really enjoy that chess match okay he's going here he's going to be in that thicket i'm going to come up over here the wind's right you know whatever yeah i enjoy that part of it well it's the just journey gets me going. and the experience over shooting the deer yeah. there, there's it's more about the journey well, and the experience for you so just to play devil's advocate to us here you know i could say it depends on the hunt too you yeah. know if i if it's if i got a, a good buck tag in my pocket and i've got something spotted or you know uncharted territory but this hunt i'm i'm buck hunting here Okay, I'm Versus. gonna I'm gonna play that game, but here in January, you know, we have a doe only season. That may change things because I'm oh. I'm meat hunting and, and <laughs> yeah. that's a given. So you know, I'm I, just thinking about it as we're having this conversation. You know, in January, I'm I'm filling the freezer. So if I see something, yeah, I'm I'm shooting. You know, most times. So I guess I don't know. I, I didn't point. really think about that, but yep, that is a good point. Yeah, it it kind of changes on intent. Yeah, And I guess that leads into, uh, here just this last season, uh, it was with a muzzleloader and typically with a muzzleloader hunting the way I hunt, the, where I typically like to hunt, I don't have the primer in the muzzleloader either because I'm, you know, the chances are I'm going to see them a long ways away and then I'll make the game That's plan true. of how to get closer. However, uh, kind of like Scott mentioned, I was going to do some still hunting Southwest Nebraska, right on the river. And this is not the first time I've ever done it, but I don't do it a lot. It's the first time in several years. And I got out of the vehicle and I put a primer in the muzzleloader and it was just lightly raining. It wasn't cold enough quite for snow. And I took one step every five to 10 mm-hmm. seconds and I covered about 200 yards. It took me quite a while and I got within 75 yards of about 12 does. Um, had there been a decent buck in the group, that would have been a really cool experience because yeah raining they had no idea i was there just moving slow a bunch of turkeys it was just awesome but again the intent wasn't to i got to get to my stand and if i bump a deer i want to shoot it it was i'm going to walk through this dense cover very slowly and try to get you know get the upper hand on them so i guess intent plays into it for me yeah that was crossing my mind too you know you hear of guys hunt, hunting that way and the other thing that i don't know if we can quite talk too much just because and it's not a super popular way of hunting around here, but you know, deer drives are, yeah. are popular. So I don't, yeah. that's something we probably can't really speak to, but you know, that is a, that is a, a way yeah. of, of hunting. You know? Well, and in some areas kind of a necessity, you know, yeah. you get, uh, in the, the, what I'm going to call the, the Midwest, the upper Midwest, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, places like that, Michigan, super dense woods. And you get down South again, super dense woods. If you don't drive them out of there, you're not going to see them. Yeah, and yeah. then the deer numbers in those areas, you know, a lot of those states, geez, they've got about as much deer as Nebraska does people. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like there's, you know, you look at Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then all those southern states to include Missouri, the deer numbers are through the roof. And so they have to manage those numbers. And so deer drives are a very important way to, to keep those numbers in check. And I, I would reckon you'd probably want to have one in the yeah, chamber. that's true. Or you'll get trampled. They'll take the fort. All right, here, another thing just crossed my mind as we were talking. Does your platform, your firearm platform, does that adjust your decision? Where, you know, AR-10, AR-15. I was about to say the versus, AR. So me, the biggest thing, and I'm thinking back, thermal. I, I enjoy doing thermal. And when we get to our spot, get out of the rig, because of the sound, you know, most times it's quiet nights. You're trying to creep in a lot of times on snow. So you're you know, trying not to crunch the snow, trying to be as quiet as possible with an AR-15 that I use Ka-ching. for firm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm putting one in as quiet as I can, even at the pickup and then, you know, moving in. So does, uh, have you hunted with the AR-10? The yes. game? So yeah, how does that change your? A little bit. Yeah. For that same reason, because when you have that AR-15, AR-10 platform dropping that bolt, you know, yeah. depending on what you do and, and we'll slow roll them as much as we can and use a forward assist just to make sure that you can stay as quiet as you can. But that's the problem is 
it's not as quiet as feeding something off of a bolt or it's yeah. not as easy as my muzzle loader's a an old lever action style mm-hmm. with a drop in so that's real quiet and easy to get yeah. that muzzle loader primed but you don't have that ability when you're running some of those yeah. ARs so you've yeah. got to look at that as well and yeah usually when I'm running ARs it's more on the you Marmot, know the predator. pig side exactly pig and coyote side are the big ones so those are I'm not as just like you I'm not as worried because I'm usually know where I'm hunting at I've got a setup that I'm going to run and I'll drop yep. it in as soon as I can, get to that position, and go from there. Yeah. Well, I like that you brought in the forward assist, too. I'm throwing together a, a six-arc Hunting AR rifle. here, finally, and I'm trying to go <laughs> lightweight. So the guys have been razzing me about, well, what do you need the forward assist for? You know, it has nothing to do with my cleaning regimen. It's because I want to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, you know, real not- quiet. <laughs> Here's a, a point I just thought of. Uh, I was running through some scenarios of some hunts in the past of mine, and one of the, one of the things I really like to do when I get set up on an animal and I finally get the chess game set up so that, you know, I'm ready for the checkmate here. Uh, what I like to do and generally in the way, in the places that I hunt, I get this opportunity is I like to get set up, take some big breaths and dry fire on the animal as if to put the crosshairs on them and actually press the trigger yeah. and drop the pin. And I can do that with an empty chamber or with a muzzle or with no primer in it. And that settles my nerves and I'm not out there trying to long ball a bunch of shots, but in the, in the, you know, those, those shot distances that are just a little bit past kind of non-traditional, um, or just a little bit past traditional rather, that to me really helps me settle in and boost my confidence. And is another reason that I like to have an empty chamber and I can just flip the bolt and, and get that dry fire out of the way or take two if I need to, and then slowly, quietly chamber that thing and. Yeah, make that, it happen. Given if you, if you're given the the time yeah. to do that, yeah, that, I haven't thought about that. That yeah. is a good idea. But that doesn't, yeah, doesn't work in the whitetail woods, <laughs> uh, yeah. and not not the whitetail woods, just the woods, right? Because I mean, you gotta have time. Yeah, you gotta have time. Yeah, that's some pretty interesting perspectives, guys. So uh, it sounds like the unanimous decision, uh, in as far as hunting goes, for normal, what I'm gonna call quote unquote normal big game either spot and stock or stationary style hunting. You don't, we don't have one in the chamber until it's kind of go time or you get to your destination, you're on the animal, uh, deer drives or varmint predator kind of thing. You know, maybe that shifts it up a little bit. And then you throw in the gas gun, you throw in the AR platform, probably advantageous from a noise perspective to yeah. keep that thing, uh, hot with the muzzle in a safe direction and a weapon on safe. Yeah, I'm interested to see what kind of kind of feedback this gets. Just you know, yeah. agreed. just to learn. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe well, there's... I'm curious. You know, you say that the feedback that we get will be interesting to see where these people comment from. You know, different parts of the yeah, world. You know, kind of here on the plains to the to the, the the Midwest and the South, and getting on the coast and see what people do, what they do in the mountains. Not only the territory. When you guys respond, let us know what you're hunting, as far as what you're carrying for a platform and what type of distances you're shooting because that all kind of plays into this. Yeah. So we have a full, well-rounded, I'm from this area of the U.S., I'm hunting this type of game with this type of platform, this is how I do it. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, guys. Well, I think we, we pretty well covered kind of the personal defense aspect of it and also the hunting aspect of it and uh, different strokes for different folks. Everybody, you know, kind of to do what you're comfortable with, but this is what we do. Anything else you want to leave the listener with? I don't have anything right now. Enjoy your uh, range time. Enjoy the time in the field. It's about the hunt. That's right. Jeez, I can't follow that up. That was good. Yeah, I like that. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on the show, guys. Appreciate it. All right. See you guys. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. If you would, please comment on this one with just like Scott said, what you're shooting, where you're hunting, how you do it, uh, or what you're carrying for personal defense. We'd love to hear from you. The more you comment and interact, the more it gets this podcast out in front of everybody else. Uh, really helps with our numbers. Comment, uh, subscribe if you haven't. Give it a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next one.